love the voice at the beginning. It's always funny. Good morning. So today we're going to talk about words. Look at words that we use to express opinions. And we are going to start working on essay writing. So when we give opinions or when we wonder about things, when we think about how things could be, mm, things that aren't exactly the way they are yet, there's special words that we use called modals. And we use them to express opinions and to also um, think about, to express how we're thinking about things wonder about things, deduce, did we know the word deduce? How did, de thinking and wondering about things is also deduction. We're thinking about how it could be or speculating or how it, deduction is speculating about how it might be. And <clears throat> speculation is thinking about how it could be. So how could it be different? So this morning, we're going to start with a six minute grammar lesson on modals of deduction and speculation. After that, we're going to listen for some of those words in another article, and then we're going to start using them to express our opinions about that subject. So let's get going. Um, I need the main screen so I can share my screen. There we go. Oop. Right. So here we are. And hopefully you will enjoy this. I'm going to scroll through the transcript of this while the article is going. So in case you want to read along a bit. Okay. Six Minute Grammar from bbclearningenglish.com Hello and welcome to Six Minute Grammar with me, Finn. And me, Catherine. And in today's programme we're having a look at modal verbs. Now, modal verbs are used in a lot of different ways, but in this programme we're looking at the modal verbs we use when we're talking about things we think are possible or true, both in the present and in the past. That's right. When we don't know something for sure, we often make guesses. And modal verbs can express how sure or unsure we are about our guesses. We'll give you lots of examples. And we'll check what you've learned in our quiz. But first, we're listening to Fiona who is a science reporter. And Fiona's talking about some ancient fossils that were found in China and Taiwan. While you listen, think about this question. Are the fossils from humans? The research teams analysing fossils found in China and Taiwan could be looking at something very important. It seems that the fossils can't be from any known human species. They might be the result of breeding between species or they may belong to an unknown human species. The fossils suggest that before modern humans arrived in Asia, more diverse human groups may have lived there than previously thought. So that was Fiona and we asked you, are the fossils from humans? And the answer is... Maybe. They might be the result of breeding between species, or they may belong to an unknown human species. Mm, so we don't know the answer for sure. Exactly. Now, the modal verbs might and may plus an infinitive show that we're talking about a present possibility, not a certainty. The modal verb could does this too, either with an infinitive or with a continuous form. Here's an example. The research teams analysing fossils found in China and Taiwan could be looking at something very important. In fact, we can say could be looking, might be looking or 
may be looking there. That's right. It's a modal verb plus a continuous form of be plus verb ing. But what about this sentence? Listen. It seems that the fossils can't be from any known human species. Fiona uses the modal can't there. Now we use can't with an infinitive when we believe strongly that something isn't possible. The researchers believe strongly that the fossils don't belong to any known human species. They can't come from a known human species. It's not possible. So they must be from an unknown human species. That's right. Must or can't plus an infinitive both help us to express a strong belief that something is or isn't possible. When we're less sure about something, we can say, for example, the fossils might not, mightn't, or may not be from a known human species. That's right, but we don't use the negative couldn't like this. It's different. Couldn't plus an infinitive means that something is completely impossible. Right then. Now let's have a look at possibilities and certainties in the past. Here's the next clip. The fossils suggest that before modern humans arrived in Asia, more diverse human groups may have lived there than previously thought. So we can also use might, may, could, can't, and must with have and the past participle of the verb when we think something was possible in the past. Yeah. So we can say may have lived, might have lived, or could have lived to express past possibility. And we use can't or must with have and the past participle when we're certain about something in the past. For example, the scientists can't have expected to find anything so important. Exactly. They must have been very excited. I'm sure they were. Six Minute Grammar from BBC Learning English. And we're talking about modal verbs. And it's quiz time.、Mm -hmm. For each of these sentences, choose might, must, or can't to fill the gap. Number one, Finn, you got an A grade in physics. Wow, you have studied really hard. And the answer is must. You must have studied really hard. I did, Catherine.、Yes. Very good, Finn. Number two, Nick just called. He's stuck in traffic. He be late. And this one is might. He might be late. Well done, number three. You have seen a ghost. There's no such thing. And the answer is can't. You can't have seen a ghost. There's no such thing. Is there, Catherine? Don't think so, Finn. What about you? No. We don't believe in ghosts. And that's the end of the quiz. I hope you got them all right. And there's more about this at bbclearningenglish.com. Join us again soon for more six-minute grammar. Bye. Bye. Six-minute grammar from the BBC. Right. Okay. What do you think? Was that interesting? Do you think you could use them in the future? Yeah. Excellent. Do you think that you might understand modals a little better now? A little. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, now we're going to go on to、um, a six-minute article、uh, from the Six Minute English、uh, about deep sea mining, and I. Chose this one because I I think you might hear the modals that we've just discussed. Okay, that we've just learned about. So let's see. See if you can hear any of the modals that we just learned about in this article. So deep sea mining is it good or bad for the planet? Six Minute English from BBC Learning English dot com. 
Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Neil. And I'm Sam. Here at Six Minute English, we often discuss the new inventions and ideas scientists dream up to fight climate change. Technologies like geoengineering, which could reduce global warming by reflecting sunlight back into space. Often these ideas are controversial because scientists disagree over whether the technology is possible and whether, in some cases, it could do more harm than good. In this program, we'll be finding out about a new idea to collect lumps of precious metals called nodules from the bottom of the ocean. The idea, known as deep sea mining, could provide the metals like copper, nickel and cobalt, which are needed for the green technology used in electric car batteries and other renewable energy. But could deep sea mining actually damage delicate ocean ecosystems as well? We'll be hearing from two experts and learning some new vocabulary soon. But first I have a question for you, Sam. Mammals like dolphins and whales represent a tiny amount of all marine biodiversity, the thousands of animal species living in the sea. Even all the different types of fish combined make up less than 3% of all living things in the ocean. So, according to recent estimates by UNESCO oceanographers, how many different marine species have their home in the ocean? Is it A, 70,000, B, 170,000, or C, 700,000? I'll guess there are around 170,000 animal species living in the sea. OK, Sam, I'll reveal the answer at the end of the programme. Deep sea mining is supported by some scientists because it could provide the raw materials, especially metals, needed to power electric cars. Amongst them is Bramley Merton, a professor of marine biology at Southampton's National Oceanographic Centre. Here he outlines the problem to BBC World Service's Science in Action. As in so many things in life, there's a, a real kind of paradox or a conundrum. The global grid capacity by 2050 is going to have to increase by, by three times. Electrical car ownership is set to increase by a factor of 25. Solar and, and wind generation is going to grow by a factor of 100. All of these things which we need to do to decarbonize are going to require raw materials and, and metals in particular. So, you know, as society, we're faced with this conundrum. We need to decarbonize. Professor Merson describes the situation using two words. Firstly, he calls it a conundrum, a problem that is very difficult to solve. He also calls it a paradox, a situation that seems impossible because it contains two opposite ideas. Deep sea mining could damage the ocean, but paradoxically, it might provide rare metals needed to decarbonize the planet. At the heart of the problem is that, in the future, green activities like driving electric cars and using solar power is going to increase by a factor of 100. If something increases by a factor of a certain number, it becomes multiplied that many times. But another marine biologist, Helen Scales, isn't convinced. Here she explains her doubts to BBC World Service Science in Action. My concern at this point is that, that deep sea mining and deep sea nodules in particular are being seen as a silver bullet to solve the climate crisis and in such a way as well that I think that we can hopefully rely on life carrying on pretty much as normal. My concern is that it really will be opening a door to something much more than those tests. It's leading down a, a rather slippery slope, I think, towards this getting permission for deep sea mining to be open on a commercial scale. Helen worries that deep sea mining will be seen as a silver bullet to the climate crisis, a simple and instant solution to a complicated problem. She thinks the tests which have been permitted to assess the difficulty of mining underwater could open the door to mining on a large scale, which would damage fragile marine ecosystems beyond repair. If you open the door to something, you allow something new to start or make it possible. Helen thinks starting deep sea mining leads down a slippery slope, a situation or habit that is difficult to stop and is likely to get worse and worse. 
and that could spell the end for thousands of marine animals and plant species. Yes, our oceans need protection as much as our land and skies, which reminds me of my question, Sam. Yes, you asked me how many different marine species live in the ocean, and I guessed it was B, 170,000. Which was the wrong answer, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. <laughs> There are estimated to be around 700,000 marine species, only about 226,000 of which have been identified so far. OK, let's recap the vocabulary we've learned from the programme, starting with conundrum, a problem that's very difficult to fix. A paradox describes a situation that seems impossible because it contains two opposite ideas. If something grows by a factor of 10, it becomes multiplied 10 times. The term a silver bullet means a simple solution to a complicated problem, often a solution that doesn't actually exist. A slippery slope is a situation or course of action that is difficult to stop and is likely to get worse and worse. And finally, the idiom to open the door to something means to allow something new to start or to make it possible. Once again, our six minutes are up. Bye for now. Goodbye. Six Minute English from the BBC. Right, so did you hear some of the modals in that? Were you able? Yes? Yes. yes. Right, good. They said a lot about what could happen. So the, yeah, and there are lots of new words for me as well. Good. Um, excellent. Uh, as I keep saying, the more different subjects that you read or listen to, the broader your vocabulary will be, and the easier things like the IELTS exam or anything else will become, because you never know what you're going to be asked. So. Very good. Good morning to everyone who's come. Uh, and while we were listening, I hope you caught a lot of that. Um, so I thought today, yeah. So hopefully everyone heard the article that we just listened to. And I am going to go back to screen sharing again. Don't know why I keep stopping this. There we go. Share the old screen again. Uh, because what I'd like to do is take the title of that article and think about it a little bit. The subject of that article was deep sea mining, right? And there was a conundrum, right? A problem with that subject, wasn't there? What was the problem or conundrum about deep sea mining? Now I've summarized it here, but let's talk about what are the problems and what are the benefits? What do we think about deep sea mining? What did they say the problems were? I'll start us off with, um, so I know I'm screen sharing, there we go. I'm gonna put together a table real quick. Oh, meant to put that underneath. So, um, Helps if I pay attention to where the cursor is when I do this. There we go. So we're going to say problems. And over here, benefits. So what did you hear in the article? Let's just talk about what was in the article. What are they going to get from the bottom of the ocean? Do we need to listen again?
Ja, eller til at sidde igen. I feel good. Okay, no problem. All right. So, let's listen to it again. And that's that's perfectly fine. We'll listen to it again. And what I want you to do is to listen for um, the conundrum that they talk about. What are the problems and what are the benefits of deep sea mining? Okay, let's listen to it one more time. It's only six minutes long. We've got time to do that. So let's think about this. So I've summarized the subject this way. Some people think that deep sea mining's potential harm to the environment outweighs the benefit of the resources it would supply. Okay. So we're going to think about the benefits and so what 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 good can come from deep sea mining and what are the problems with this? Okay, I'll stop popping around. So try and listen for the six minute English from BBC Learning English dot com. Hello, this is Six Minute English from BBC Learning English. I'm Neil. And I'm Sam. Here at Six Minute English, we often discuss the new inventions and ideas scientists dream up to fight climate change. Technologies like geoengineering, which could reduce global warming by reflecting sunlight back into space. Often these ideas are controversial because scientists disagree over whether the technology is possible and whether, in some cases, it could do more harm than good. In this program, we'll be finding out about a new idea to collect lumps of precious metals called nodules from the bottom of the ocean. The idea, known as deep sea mining, could provide the metals like copper, nickel and cobalt, which are needed for the green technology used in electric car batteries and other renewable energy. But could deep sea mining actually damage delicate ocean ecosystems as well? We'll be hearing from two experts and learning some new vocabulary soon. But first I have a question for you, Sam. Mammals like dolphins and whales represent a tiny amount of all marine biodiversity, the thousands of animal species living in the sea. Even all the different types of fish combined make up less than 3% of all living things in the ocean. So, according to recent estimates by UNESCO oceanographers, how many different marine species have their home in the ocean? Is it A, 70,000, B, 170,000, or C, 700,000? I'll guess there are around 170,000 animal species living in the sea. OK, Sam, I'll reveal the answer at the end of the programme. Deep sea mining is supported by some scientists because it could provide the raw materials, especially metals, needed to power electric cars. Amongst them is Bramley Merton, a professor of marine biology at Southampton's National Oceanographic Centre. Here he outlines the problem to BBC World Service's Science in Action. As in so many things in life, there's a, a real kind of paradox or a conundrum. The global grid capacity by 2050, we're going to have to increase by, by three times. Electrical car ownership is set to increase by a factor of 25. Solar and, and wind generation is going to grow by a factor of 100. All of these things which we need to do to decarbonize are going to require raw materials and, and metals in particular. So, you know, as society, we're faced with this conundrum. We need to decarbonize. Professor Merson describes the situation using two words. Firstly, he calls it a conundrum, a problem that is very difficult to solve. He also calls it a paradox, a situation that seems impossible because it contains two opposite ideas. Deep sea mining could damage the ocean, but paradoxically, it might provide rare metals needed to decarbonize the planet. At the heart of the problem is that, in the future, green activities like driving electric cars and using solar power is going to increase by a factor of 100. If something increases by a factor of a certain number, it becomes multiplied that many times. But another marine biologist, Helen Scales, isn't convinced. Here she explains her doubts to BBC World Service Science in Action. 
My concern at this point is that that deep sea mining and deep sea nodules in particular are being seen as a silver bullet to solve the climate crisis and in such a way as well that I think that we can hopefully rely on life carrying on pretty much as normal. My concern is that it really will be opening a door to something much more than those tests. It's leading down a, a rather slippery slope, I think, towards this getting permission for deep sea mining to be open on a commercial scale. Helen worries that deep sea mining will be seen as a silver bullet to the climate crisis, a simple and instant solution to a complicated problem. She thinks the tests which have been permitted to assess the difficulty of mining underwater could open the door to mining on a large scale, which would damage fragile marine ecosystems beyond repair. If you open the door to something, you allow something new to start or make it possible. Helen thinks starting deep sea mining leads down a slippery slope, a situation or habit that is difficult to stop and is likely to get worse and worse. And that could spell the end for thousands of marine animals and plant species. Yes, our oceans need protection as much as our land and skies. Which reminds me of my question, Sam. Yes, you asked me how many different marine species live in the ocean. And I guessed it was B, 170,000. Which was the wrong answer, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. <laughs> There are estimated to be around 700,000 marine species, only about 226,000 of which have been identified so far. OK, let's recap the vocabulary we've learned from the program, starting with conundrum, a problem that's very difficult to fix. A paradox describes a situation that seems impossible because it contains two opposite ideas. If something grows by a factor of 10, it becomes multiplied 10 times. The term a silver bullet means a simple solution to a complicated problem, often a solution that doesn't actually exist. A slippery slope is a situation or course of action that is difficult to stop and is likely to get worse and worse. And finally, the idiom to open the door to something means to allow something new to start or to make it possible. Once again, our six minutes are up. Bye for now. Goodbye. Six Minute English from the BBC. Right. Now, what are, hopefully you can remember, well, what did you, just give me some ideas. What do you, what do you think of the article, of the subject in general? And what do you remember from the article? What would you like to say um, or express it about it? It's interesting because I've never knew that mining is used in uh, in the sea. Yeah. Okay. So, deep sea mining. It's a very interesting idea. So, what does it mean? What were they finding? Why? Why do they want to do it? What's the raw material that you for cars? What can you explain? What is a raw material? Material. Oh, um, so a lump of rock that has um, iron inside it okay. is raw material, but you have to take that and you have to process it to get the iron out of it that you can then use. Okay. So um, that's a raw material. Anything, um, actually anything, uh, that has not been made into something. You could say that the wheat growing in the field is the raw material for the bread that you make. Yeah, that's why I was confused when you say raw materials for me. Raw it means even meat when it's raw. So I was like confused. So yes. What raw means material? So raw in this sense means unprocessed. Okay. Okay, no process, no extraction has happened with it. It's just as it came from the ground, or in the case of food, as it came from the field. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, oh, sorry. And what kind of raw materials did they talk about finding? Did anyone hear what kind of raw materials they talked about finding? They're talking about metals. Yes, so there were metals. 
And we can flip over to the article. Let's see, here we are. When he's talking about the um, power. Okay. Um, yes, the raw materials, especially metals. Um, there, let me see if I can. See if I can. Um, um, no, that. <laughs> All right. Not that one. So, um, oh, I see that's the vanishing pen. So, the raw materials, especially metals, there, I think somewhere down they say, they talk about the nodules of, yes, deep sea nodules where they can find the, uh, uh, I should have been highlighting it while I was going. So, all right, so the benefit is that they can get raw materials and metals. So we can put that in a benefit. What are the problems with deep sea mining? No, that one I didn't catch. The second person was talking about what the problems were. Actually, yeah. Was it best because it will lead to commercial um do body? She said something about commercial um Yeah, working on a commercial it will be more scale. Yeah, oh yeah. Commercial scale uh, it's gonna be I can't find words. Oh my god, I can't find words to describe yeah. it. It is good, but it's way is used in a very big um industries it may lead to a problem in the future yeah as we well, see a lot of things always when they start it's good but then at the end it's always there's a damage yes so um good at the start but too much um us Lots of damage to the ocean, mm. right? So yeah. the, basically, the 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 best part, the the benefit is the um, raw materials, and the problem is damage to the ocean. Yeah, and which one's going to be bigger? Which is going to make our planet better? Right? Uh, will it be? The um, well, the benefits of the raw materials and decarbonizing human um, action. <laughs> they could. I think that I will take the ocean because the damage to the ocean. Because I know that the 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 materials can it can make life much easier, and even yeah, the carbonizing the planet is good, but it will damage the ocean. And the ocean is um. How do they say is um uh, feeding to a uh, lots of uh, species? Yes, and it is to us too. And uh, going into the ocean will kill will kill lots of uh, species. So I think I would take the damage to the o ocean. That's more, of, yeah, yeah. So the question is, which is the which is which is going to give us so. What this statement, right, is saying, uh, so I set this statement up like a task two exam question, all right? And okay. this would be followed by discuss both sides and 
give your opinion. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So, um, so if we think about both sides of this, these are the things that we would think about, right? So what could we mm -hmm. say about what other words would you use to describe the benefits of deep sea mining, of getting these minerals out of the ocean? And do we know what they were needed for? What do we need them for? Electro car, electronic. Um, yeah, anything with electricity and yeah. Um, so they need them for solar panels, all of the things for the electricity. They need the copper. Mm. Um, there we go. Raw materials like metals like copper. Excellent. And how about the world? Can I ask a question before we go? I see okay. words that I don't understand. I, I think I get the hint, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure what it means. Decarbonizing. What does uh, it mean? Can you explain it to me? Okay. Well, carbonizing um, is getting rid of fossil fuels. Now, do you know what that means? No. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we've watched some other articles on global warming and climate change. Yes. And burning fossil fuels like coal and oil mm -hmm. okay those are fossil fuels those are actually the compressed bodies of ancient animals and plants and when we burn them we put carbon into the atmosphere okay and that's what's causing global climate change And that's yeah, what... I understand that. I understand that. But the fossil fuels mean that, right? So decarbonizing would be getting rid of fossil fuels. So instead of burning coal, we're using solar panels to generate electricity. Okay. Okay, I think I get it. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions about this? That's all right. Okay, maybe this was too complicated a subject. <laughs> I thought I could tie all of this together, but it's a bit complicated. Um, so, um, so the thing is that, so the benefit, this benefits the environment. Uh, okay. Um, and these are things that damage the environment. So the conundrum, the paradox that they talked about, do you remember the words conundrum and paradox in the article? Yeah. So our current use of fossil fuels is damaging the environment. Mm -hmm. So getting the metals to get rid of the carbon is a good thing, right? Yeah. But damaging the ocean in order to get the min minerals is a bad yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. And it has two sides of story. It's like yes. two sides of story. It's one story about two sides. Yes, it's like a quarry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So whether it's a surface mine, which is very damaging to nature, <laughs> yeah. getting things from the ocean also damages nature. But then 
not getting the minerals and continuing to burn fossil fuels also damages nature. <laughs> and that's why it's a conundrum or a paradox because there's negatives on both sides. Yeah. So it's a very hard choice to make. So the article was talking about, we have one person who thinks that, um, he, I, Professor Merton identifies the paradox, right? The conundrum, the problem that's difficult to solve. Um, because we need the minerals, but uh, uh, we don't want to in, um, destroy the environment. And uh, Helen Scales is concerned that uh, once this is begun to be exploited, it will be too profitable to stop. That's why she describes it as a slippery slope. So that once people can see that, oh, we can get minerals for money off of the ocean floor, then they will do it more and more and more and it will destroy the deep ocean environment. I... Is that clear? Yeah, it's clear. I just have a question. Another word that come there that I noticed you highlighted before is nodule. Oh, yes. So they described them as... Right up, yeah. Just the... Ipsy nodules, yes. Um, it's what they're mining for. It's, it's they're, they're lumps of, of raw materials that have a lot of metal in them. Um, I thought, yes. So it is supported by some scientists. Yeah, that's what the nodule is. Um, it's a funny word. It just means a lump of something or something sticking out. Okay. Okay. So they could have said lumps of metal and it would have been the same. So nodule there is a lump of metal. So, um, So the profit motive, so commercialization of it will make it very profitable for people to do more and more, increasing the damage. Okay, so are there other words that we would use just to think about what, what other words would we use to describe what's going on here? Can you think of words about the environment? We've talked, while we've been talking about this, some of the words have come up. What is the problem with fossil fuels? Why do we want to decarbonize our activities? What's that overarching word, phrase that we used to describe that? Did you say it again? So um, when I was talking about the decarbonizing, getting rid of fossil fuels, why do we want to do that? Why is that needed? What uh, because, of, because we um, burn lots of stuff. Yeah. Lots of um, factories or companies, they burn lots of stuff and they cause like, that's how I can describe it. That can cause a problem to the air and that can cause a problem to the atmosphere on the air. Yeah, climate change. 
Oh yeah, um, thank you. Global warming. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I missed that one. I know no, how to no, explain, it. but I don't know the. Uh... That's all right. That's what we're. That's that's why we're we're talking about it is to build up these this vocabulary as well. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, this is super hard class this week. Um. But, uh, so, but good job keeping up. Uh, hopefully you're all keeping up. So, um, burning coal or oil. So, um, so what, what do, do you know what we refer to? What phrases would we use to describe, uh, solar power or electric cars? What are those called? We use a color to describe them. The opposite of burning coal or oil. We use a color to describe it. A green? Yes. Green energy. Right? So these yeah. are things. So we're trying to. I was trying to find the end, but I just remember. I know you know you see a lot of the adverts with green energy, and I just remembered green. What? Good. I don't know. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Excellent. So this is, uh, this is why it's good to read a lot of articles about the environment, about social programs, about things like that, because it will build that vocabulary and you'll get the context more and more. All right. Um, so these aren't technical terms. They're, they're, you know, what we use day to day to talk about these things. So, right. Well, there we are. We've had a little bit of a look on that. And now I'm going to talk about, so this is taking a subject and exploring, all right, problems and benefits inside that subject, all right? And this is often what you need to do in a task to IELTS uh, essay question. It is also what you often need to do in your um, essays at university, all right? You need to be able to look at an idea, take it apart, think about it, figure out what's good and what's bad, all right? So uh, let's look at the structure of and how we approach an IELTS writing task too. Okay, um, first and foremost, <laughs> where is the answer in an IELTS question, in, in, in an IELTS exam, where do you find the answer? Question. In the question, yay. <laughs> See, we repeat it enough, everyone gets it. Good job. Yes, the question, it's the most important part. It really is. Uh, so make sure you read the question. That's the real key to writing task two. We don't want to put our pencils down until we know exactly what we're going to write. So we are going to highlight the guide words in a question, find the major points that we need to cover, list synonyms and detail words. All right, so that's what we were doing up here. Notice we added some extra language words down below to um, to guide us in our writing. We would definitely want to use those collocations, those sets of words to create our essay. And then the next is to build an outline or a map to follow. All right, so you can write down some ideas, but remember when we did the paragraph, we then pulled those ideas into an order. It's like, wait, these things go together and those things go together. And I can start here, go to this one, 
that one and that one. Now, what part of the marking scheme is that going to give you a seven on? Do you remember on the marking scheme for the task two, we looked at it last week? So up to here, the first four steps to writing this essay are half your mark. All right. Understand plan? Yes, understanding the question and planning your response. Exactly. And that means that you will complete the task. You will fulfill all of the task requirements. And you will have a well-ordered, logical sequence in your essay. So that's the key to getting half the marks. And that's what puts you in the seven category. All right. So that's going to get you your best marks. It'll also get your, your best marks at university in your essays. Make sure we... So we're going to practice this today. Then we need minimum four paragraphs. And um, I, my, my youngest son um, is autistic and I taught him to write essays at home. And he also does karate. And I, um, in karate, you follow patterns of movement called katas and you learn them and you repeat them and so i gave him a kata for essay writing the first paragraph tell us what you are going to tell us i'll write this in all right That's the beginning. So your introductory paragraph, you are going to tell the reader what you are going to write about. Okay, so tell us what you are going to tell us. And then after that, the next two paragraphs, two or three paragraphs are quite simple. Tell us one, Tell us two, and then the conclusion is super easy because there you tell us what you have told us. All right. So this is the magic formula to a perfect English essay. So you start with telling the reader, and actually I think I'm gonna take the, let's take the bolding out of this so it's more legible. Oop, there we go. You start by telling the reader what you are going to tell the reader. So tell us what you are going to tell us. Tell us, tell us, tell us what you have told us. All right. So this is your kata for writing an essay, for your IELTS essay and for your basic essay. Tell us what you are going to tell us. Tell us, tell us, tell us what you have told us. So in the introduction, you're going to say, these are the benefits and these are um, uh, the, the problems with deep sea mining. I think that um, the benefits far outweigh the uh, problems. And 
as it's far too important. Uh, decarbonizing is far more important than any risk to the fragile oceans, right? So that tells you what I'm going to talk about, right? And then you can have your two points or three, depending on the length of your paragraph and how your structure is. And then you describe why, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what can be done to mitigate the dam, uh, you know, why, why the uh, retrieval of those minerals is so important and what can be done to mitigate the damage to the ocean, right? So, um, and in the conclusion, you would say that, as you see, it's far more important <laughs> to get the minerals to decarbonize than it is to keep the environment completely pure. So if that's the opinion you want to put forward, if you want to put the other opinion forward, that's the same thing. All right, so that's your kata. Tell us what you're going to tell us. Then write a paragraph on each of those ideas that you've told us you're going to tell us about, supported with examples. All right. And then in the conclusion, you tie it all together, referring to what you have said in those paragraphs. So what part of this essay, do you think you would actually want to plan first? What do you think? What's going to be the most important part of planning? Where's the content? Where's the, the meat in this essay sandwich? Where's all the lovely falafels and sauce? The positive and negative stuff that we are gonna tell, like the difference between the two points. Yeah, so it's gonna be in this section, right? That's where that's where all the content is. Because up here you're telling us what the content will be, right? And here you're telling us what the content was right so in reality you're only writing two or three paragraphs about the idea with examples to support your idea because you're going to summarize it in the introduction and again in the conclusion So you're actually having to write less than you think you are, all right? The most important part are these paragraphs in the middle, all right? So that's what is going to be in our outline or our mind map, okay? When we create this, I'm gonna keep using these charts um, like, like this to separate because it's a, it's a very easy way to write it down. I used to do a drawing around my hand because then you've got one for each of your paragraphs. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to work on an outline or a mind map or um, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm liking using a simple chart because it's, it's easy on uh, online. And it's also easy on paper as well. So, right. So really all we've got to do is write those middle paragraphs. I find that we need to, to create the content for those middle paragraphs and everything else is writing about those. And then there is a magic method. Now I know this method <laughs> because I come from the land before uh, time, yes, before spell check or grammar checkers. So I had to do all of it myself. 
either handwriting or on a typewriter. Yeah, I'm that old. And uh, I did find, and I have abysmal spelling, and I think faster than my hand goes. So I often have to clean up my grammar and my spelling quite a lot after I've written something. So there is a magic method for error checking. And I'd like for you to uh, practice writing things by hand and then look it over using this method and not using this method. So if you write a paragraph, uh, read it from the top down and see how many mistakes you can find. Then next, read it one sentence at a time in reverse order. And um, I know I've told you before, I, I love the um, neurology of learning and language. And there's this amazing thing. If you write a paragraph and read it from the top down, you're brain is going to edit what you see and it's going to show you what you think you wrote not what's actually on the paper uh, i've tested this out in many classes it really is a real thing and uh, if you read the sentences in reverse order you will see twice as many errors and be able to fix them so um, it, it breaks the assumptions that your brain makes um, to make things get faster so, right. So here we are. We've got this essay to write, and we have only two or three paragraphs to worry about. We need to come up with ideas and examples to support them, and we're good to go. So let's look at some questions. Now, um, I think I was going to keep going on this one, but I think maybe, um, well, actually, let's let's look at what kind of question is this? There's a lot of different kinds. So this one is called a, it's got discuss both sides. That's very important. What other things are important in this sentence that tell us what we need to write about? What are the two sides? If we, what are the words that describe the two sides of deep sea mining? Some people think that deep sea mining's potential harm to the environment outweighs the benefit of the resources it would supply. So what are the two things we're going to be talking about in this essay? What are our two sides? Oh. A benefit and damage. Yeah. So uh, stop that. There we go. So we've got potential harm. Um, Actually, let's just stick with potential harm and benefit of the resources. Yeah, now let's do potential harm to the environment is the whole thing. So there's our two sides and you see that they're in the question. All right, the, the, the answer is in the question. <laughs> the two things we need to discuss are the harm to the environment and the benefit of the resources. And the opinion that we need to give. What do we need to, what is the opinion that we need to give? There's, a, there's two words that describe the opinion that we need to, to give. If it's more beneficial or more harmful. Yep, exactly. And the word, the key word would be outweighs. Which one is heavier? Which one is more important? All right. So we need to discuss, whoops, I'll make that one pink like the both sides. So that's what we need to discuss. 
a Does science. it matter which one we choose? No, it doesn't. Here's the magic of these. What you write is um what what you choose to say is uh entirely up to you and you will not be marked on uh giving an unpopular opinion it won't matter what matters is that you state um you you state your opinion and you support it okay that's the key you can lie um I have actually written a IELTS style essay defending the fact that clothes are not necessary. <laughs> no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't it's bother. With that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. It's it's a thoroughly supported IELTS style essay. You know, it's a basic, you know, structured five paragraph essay clearly describing the benefits and and um detriment of you know the, the the benefits of of wearing clothing versus not wearing clothing i thoroughly defend the fact that clothing is unnecessary <laughs> now do you, you can make me of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so i i'll i will definitely um i'll put that in the email in case you want to see it um oh, i would love to thank you <laughs> <laughs> because what it shows, what I really want to show in that essay is that you don't, you can lie. You don't have to give your opinion. The only thing that matters is that you are able to think of examples to support the ideas in the essay and that you can write a clearly structured, well-ordered essay. That's all that's, that matters. The opinion you give is not marked. It's entirely how well you write it and how you support it. The examples, are you able to put it in a logical format? Can you support it in a reasonable way? I came up with some very good ideas of why you don't need clothes. Uh, <laughs> but, so you don't have to even believe what you're writing. The only, the only the only way you need to judge which opinion you choose to support is how well can I write this? Can I think of all of the examples that I need? Can I think of enough ideas to get to write a good essay out of this? Then take that opinion. If it happens to not be the opinion you hold, that's fine. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. So on any of these, it doesn't matter what opinion you hold. It only matters how well you can uh, support it. So let's look at some other sample questions. So let's look at this top one. Schools are spending more time teaching traditional subjects such as history. Some people think they should rather spend more time in teaching skills that can help students find a job. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Okay, so what are our subjects in this? What are we going to be writing about? If I agree, uh, uh, schools should uh, well, teach so uh, skills for. Am I right? Okay, I just. What are the don't yeah, don't worry about your opinion. What is the subject? What is the subject? What are what are the history? Are, history. Yes. Okay. Tradition. We've got traditional subjects such as history. history. Yep versus what skills skills job skills for job exactly oh, that's our two sides bravo well mm -hmm. spotted well spotted excellent and what is the key word what is the key word that we need 
to focus on. This is slightly tricky. So Spending what's extending? Time? The key word here is should. What should the yeah. schools? Okay. Does are we are we asking are we being asked what are our schools spending more time on history uh, rather than job skills? No. We're not being asked about whether they are teaching skills or not teaching skill or, or traditional subjects, right? It's what they should be doing. It's the value judgment that we have to agree or disagree with. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's really our key word and should becomes our key word in the, in the question. What should schools be doing? All right. So it's, this is saying schools are, so are we going to write an essay about um, all of the traditional subjects that schools are teaching? We can because they said uh, such as they didn't but, say just history. No. Um, so actually, I would leave that um, unhighlighted. So it's really between uh, job skills and traditional subjects. Subjects, yeah. Okay. So it's between those two. But the magic word is what should the schools be teaching? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I wanted to highlight. There's always going to be a, a value word, a modal like should, or a superlative like best. So, so um, another version of this would be um, schools time is best spent teaching job skills rather than traditional subjects or, okay? So we're looking for words, these value judgment words, because that's what we need to focus on in our opinion is what, so we're going to be talking about what traditional subjects are and some of the benefits maybe, and what job skills that they can teach are and some of the benefits of those. And then we can say that, Therefore, we think schools should be teaching more of this, whichever one we choose. Does that make sense? So this is our this is our real question is traditional should schools be teaching traditional subjects or job skills? What do you think? All right, so how about the next one? Let's look again for the, what is the subject that we're going to be talking about? And what is it that they're asking for us to evaluate or agree or disagree on? Parenting costs. Yes. So parenting training course is our subject. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is the magic word that we have to agree or disagree? Now they have actually repeated it in the questions. So mm. What's the value word that they're asking us to agree or disagree with? Bring their children. Is it bring their children? Well, just, just read the question at the end. Do you agree? That's the same. 
the God, parents I heard it. attending the course with uh, with their children. Yeah, necessary. Thank you. I thought I heard someone say necessary. Necessary. Yes, necessary. Okay. It's not whether there should be uh, whether they should be available, whether it should be optional. It's whether it's necessary. Okay. What do we mean? What do we mean by necessary? Do you know what the word necessary? Important. Very important. Yeah. Okay. You could say very important. And oh, let me just bring this down to a smaller. There we go. So we could say very important. What's another way of saying necessary? It's necessary to have a driver's license in order to drive. It is. You have to, for example. Yes. Have to. Have to. <laughs> uh, you could say required. Okay. So it's important to look at that keyword and come up with some synonyms for it because it's quite a different thing to say, oh, it should be, uh, parenting courses should be available for parents to take them or should it be necessary? Should they have to take them? Should it be required? That's a very different question, isn't it? From saying, should they be available or should they be required? Very different questions. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so let's look at the next one. What is the subject and what is the keyword that we're going to be focusing on? What is the subject? International sports events. Yep. So we've got international sports for a subject. And what else is a subject? There's some help. other. Help. <laughs> is it help or no? Well, mm -hmm. help is important, but what is help? Essence. Is it? It's not a subject. So there's another noun in this uh, in this sentence. Word, please. Yes, exactly. So our subject yeah. is the relationship between international sports and world peace, and the key word is world peace. The key oh, help. Word. Yes. Help world peace. Yeah. Help. So international sports. How does international sports relate to world peace? Does it help? All right. And you can even see, do you agree or disagree that sports events help? So important, they repeated it. Okay. So what's our essay going to be about? About international sports mm -hmm. events. Yeah. So we need mm -hmm. to talk about like the World Cup, uh, maybe the Olympics, things that are international mm -hmm. sports. Yeah. And we need to say, yeah. does this does this build world peace? Are there examples that you can think of where people have come together and been more peaceful because of them? Or can you give examples of where they have failed to create more world peace? <laughs> All right. So and at that point, you can say whether you agree or disagree. All right. I'm going to skip over the next one and go to um, Yeah, let's go to a discussion essay. So 
How about this one? Some people say it is okay to use animals for our benefit. Others say it is not good to exploit them. Discuss both points of view and give your opinion. So what are our subject words? Is it okay to use animals for our benefits? So, yep, it's animals for our benefit. Yeah, sorry, use use animals for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's good. So, and some people say, Some people say, is it okay or is it exploitation? All right. So this one is a good or bad. So basically it's either good or not good. <laughs> so this one, we've got one subject with two uh, keywords, which are basically just Is it good or bad to use animals for our benefit? Or is it exploitation? Wow. And so at the point you can, but so you, the important thing, you do have to talk about what is good about using animals and what is bad about using animals. Okay, because we do have to do both points of view. All right. All right. So hopefully this is helping you understand how to look at and how, we're going to no, no, okay. approach, how we will approach the um the essays when we get there. Let's look at advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, So, oh, there we go. Let's 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 go with this one down here. I'll I'll bring it to the top. In some countries, a foreign language is taught at primary schools. Do the advantages of learning new a new language outweigh the disadvantages? So. There are no disadvantages in that one. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Can you think of any disadvantages? So foreign language. Yeah. Any excuse would be irrational. I don't know. <laughs> Um, yeah. So you would definitely say that the advantages outweigh, and once again, we've got that word outweigh the disadvantages. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. Are there any downsides? Uh, some people say that children learn language more slowly when they learn two languages at the same time, but um, I don't agree. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. This is a good one. Uh, so here we go. This and this one is a direct question. So. Some universities offer online courses for students. Do you think this is a positive or negative development for students? So is this good or bad for students? So what's our subject? Um, online course, online courses. Online courses, exactly. And we're going to be talking about 
are they good or bad? Oh. Yeah. Boink. And this is going to be, there we go. Right. Okay. So, um, So let's take one of these <laughs> and try pulling it apart and creating a um, and creating an outline. So let's look at this one. This is a problem and solution. Um, Actually, this is what is it? Let's find a good. What's a good problem and solution? Or, oh, okay. Tell you what. Let's just take this one. All right. Is that? Do we want to talk about the benefits of online courses? Yeah, you don't have to get the last. There. Let's see what we can do. So, uh. What are we going to do to start brainstorming? You just, uh, so the first thing we do when we read this, so we've identified, we've just sat down at the, uh, we've just opened up the, the booklet to the task two uh, essay. We've read it. We've figured out what our subject is and what we need to uh, uh, express an opinion on. We've got our keyword for that and our subject. All right, so we're good to go. Right, so now yeah. we're going to think of ideas. You just said what? You don't have to get dressed. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I'll add that to my clothing optional um, essay too. <laughs> so I'm going to drop this down to 12 points. So it's a bit smaller. Um, good. Don't have to get dressed. What else? What's good? Sleep more. <laughs> Sleep more. Okay, now the the real stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's better for the for nature because we don't use public transportation or even any transportation. So no transportation. Excellent. What's another benefit? You can be in any country. Oh. Excellent. More options to study. Ooh. Excellent. You don't have to pay for um, a student accommodation. Yes, I told you I couldn't. I I couldn't spell. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no one ever believes me, but I really can't. Um, so we've got a lot of lovely positives here. I'm gonna put them into a nice little organizational chart. Real quick, and how oh, about yeah. how about I, some? I have, yeah, students can cheat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what else? They can sleep during the class and no one will know. Okay. Um, lot of um, background noise. Ooh. 
if the house is not quiet. Yep. Not as not as as regular an environment as a classroom. <laughs> right. What else? What about not everyone will be focusing concentration? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Focus <laughs> and concentration. I heard both of those words. Concentration. There we go. Focus and concentration. What about uh? Um, meeting other students and helping them. Uh, yeah, also. Would, yeah, so uh, how would we say that? What would you think? You don't meet people physically. You don't make new friends as well. Yeah, no community. No, no new. Well, harder to make new friends, we'll say. Yeah, it's a very it's some, kind of it sometimes makes you lazy. <laughs> Excellent. So look at that. Don't share skills. <laughs> Say again. We don't share skills as well. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So um now the fun thing is we look at this and we try and think of examples that would be um what how would we a what are the areas that would be easiest to write about okay uh some of them are more serious than others so we want to make sure that we're writing a good essay so what are the areas, what are the positives that you could come up with two or three examples of? Let's try two examples. Transportation. So transportation. So no expense, no cost. And what's another thing that you can talk about with transportation? I will go with more options to study because everyone will think about uh, the countries. Yeah. Um, well, it does. We need, you know, three of these is really good. So if we if we talk about transportation as in costs, we could also include the accommodation costs, right? Um, as part of that section. So we could link those two together, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna just link those two together that way. Um, and you know, in some respects, more options to study, yes, because you can take courses from any country, right? So options to study can also talk about um the the countries as well so these two could go together couldn't they does that make sense so yes. options to study um so different kinds of we could list some different kinds of courses that you might be able to get from different uh, colleges, right? So at this point, you'd want to talk about, so what are some things you could study? Video editing. Okay. Video editing. Computer science. Yep. I'm going to turn that off. Oh, off. There we go. Video editing, computer science, science. Excellent. Graphic um, design. Do we need more examples? Yeah. And 
Hospitality. Uh, oh, yeah. So you don't want a whole laundry list. Okay. But it's good to have a lot. <laughs> uh, it's good to have some. So um, how about can be in any country? Um, no need for a visa. <laughs> yeah. Um, opportunities not available in your country. Great. So that follows through on options to study. So breaks down barriers. Okay. So we've got costs. So um, car, public transportation, and so these are examples here. So that's this is exactly how we build an essay. All right. So we're going to use the ones that we can come up with the um, uh, the most ideas for. All right. Um, let's see. So how about these? How about these? I can see two different ideas that um, inside all of this list, okay, in the negative section. The communication part. Yes. And mm. so there's student behavior. Um, and there's the environment and community. So I would move background noise down there, sharing skills and, oops. So these are effects on the individual and these are effects on the, the um, Oh, actually, I suppose background noise should go up there too. Whoops. So we could put that up here as well. So do you see how I've shifted these into related topics? So these are about the individual. These are all about the individual student. And this is about the classroom community. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's how I would order the negative section. So we'd have a paragraph about the negatives of online courses, and this would be all about the positives. So we've got our two paragraphs in the middle, practically written. All we've got to do is turn these into sentences. Can you see it? Can you repeat, please? All we have to do is take these ideas and turn them into sentences for our paragraphs okay. because we've got a positives paragraph and a negatives paragraph. Right? Mm -hmm. And we've got two main groups of ideas for each of our paragraphs. We've got the costs and the options, right, over in the positives. And in the negatives, we've got the problems for the individual and the problems for the classroom. Yeah? So okay. there's 
So there's our two paragraphs. <laughs> We've already written them. And all we did was come up with ideas, didn't we? Yeah. And we've already done two thirds of the writing. This is what I'm hoping to show you is that by using this brainstorming and then organizing your brainstormed ideas and picking out the best of them, it will get you further and faster through your essay. And that 40 minutes will be more than enough time to get your essay written. All right. Any questions about what we've just done here? It was a good one to think about. Everybody came up with really good ideas for this one. Well done. Well done. And all we have to do is now turn those into paragraphs, decide whether or not we could use that just as a funny thing. It's okay to write something funny in there too. But so. And we, once we know what's going to be in those two paragraphs, now we could write our introduction and our conclusion very quickly, all right? Because we now know exactly what we're going to be writing about. So once again, I will include all of this in the notes. And then I've got a challenge for you which um, is I've got an essay, a model essay here, and I want you to read the essay and tell me, this is a super challenge, tell me what was the question that this writer was answering, okay? Uh -huh. Ooh, yes, so read the essay. Uh, this will be in the in the attached in the notes. So what I want you to do is to read this essay. I want you to figure out what the question was that they were answering. Because this is a very good answer and you should be able to figure out what they were asked. Okay. And then you'll see those two good paragraphs here that start with first of all and second. Right, and we know the conclusion is here because it says in conclusion. Um, the question is in the first paragraph. Is it? All of it, yeah. It should be. Yes, so that's your homework is to read this essay and I want you to tell me what the question the writer was answering and create an outline. What is the, what is the plan? See if you can draw out what they used as a plan in order to write this, okay? So you need to find the main points in the paragraphs and the examples that they use to support them, all right? So see if you can find the plan that we just created up here, right? We just created a plan for an essay. See if you can find the plan in this essay. What did they plan in order to write this? Okay, that's your super challenge for this week. Hopefully this has been helpful. Um, thanks for, you guys have been fantastic. You really worked hard this week. I'm super, I'm really, really appreciate all the hard work you've put in. Are there any major questions about the essay writing this week? Yes, but not related to the course now. Oh, okay. Well, you... For the essay. Okay. Would you be able to share with us few sentences or words that can be beneficial for the essay that we will be writing for the IELTS? Yes. Like to make us look more clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. What I want you to do is read a lot of example essays. Um. I gave you a link uh, in the past to that. And... Yes, I have it, but I didn't check it yet. I don't know if it's okay. just questions or with answers. It's both. 
Okay, the the okay. the one that is um IELTS uh, uh IELTS academic. Uh, Let me check. Uh, I have IELTS writing practice. Yeah, that one. That one oh, with, yeah. with all of those essays. Okay. Yeah, they've all got examples. Um that that is your heavy place for practicing. Um and what I'd love for you to do is to I'm um, putting that in the um uh I've put that in the chat too if you want to grab that link right now. Um the essay that I've just shown you that I want you to deconstruct, that I want you to unwrite, um, that is from that site. Uh, they are really good examples. Um, there are memorizing sentences to use in your essay will um, be recognized by the uh, marker. They will know them, they will recognize them, and they will deduct them from your word count. So, what? yes, do not memorize sentences to use in your essay. Even it's, if they are relevant? They better be completely 100% relevant. Um, there are phrases you can use, those are good. But if you memorize whole sentences, um, it, it, they'll see it. I can see it. It's, it's, unfortunately, it is really, really obvious if you memorize a sentence to use in your essay. Oh, yeah. No, this is not what I meant. I meant like oh. connection, connecting points. Oh, yeah. Um, the connecting words, yeah. all of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This kind of stuff. I will spend time on that. Uh, I'll let me get you, get you some resources to go along with, but I will also send you a, um, a, a I'll send you some resources for that and I will we will go over that uh, next week, okay? Okay, I have one more question. Yep, you got it. I've been doing reading and listening practices a lot. Oh, good. Um, um, with during the it's like with an exam and with grades at the end. So whenever I have something like a sentence that uh, missing words. Mm -hmm. And I can put up to three words, maximum three words. And I use, let's say, what killed these people? I put the wall. And they they consider that is this is an incorrect answer, and the answer should be wall, not the wall. But it does fit. It still fit the word so, count? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can put up to three words. So I just put the wall. Yeah. It was uh, something, the wall in their house, something like that. So they wanted just the word wall, not the okay. wall. All right. So do you think uh, that will be uh, that will be considered as correct during the arts exam or it's going to be just like that? If it's inside, if it's inside the word limit, it will be marked correct. OK. OK. If it is in, if it is, if you have the option of three words and uh, the answer is uh, they think the answer, and it's just the wall. If it's an art, an extra article, so long as it doesn't go over the word limit, you're fine. It will be accepted. Okay, because okay. it happened with me several times, not just this one. This yeah, is why can, it annoyed me. Okay, yeah. If you can show me, uh, if you want to send me um, the. Uh, uh, I can't access them now, but once okay. I face this issue, I will take a screenshot and send it to you. Please do. Please do. Okay. I'd love to see it. And yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you all very, very much. You've been fantastic and very patient. And I look forward to working with you next week. <laughs> take Thanks. See you.